I started my first full-time job in Boston as a mechanical engineer too at a company called Sloan that specializes in the design and manufacture of automated flush valves. After three and a half years, I moved to Cupertino, home of Apple Park, and started my new job as a product and process engineer at Foxconn working on next generation iPhones. My first and second jobs were drastically different, but in today's video, I wanna share my unique experience working in Silicon Valley as a mechanical engineer for any of you thinking about getting into tech and working at one of the so-called fang companies. Silicon Valley is one of the few places in the world that's densely populated with thousands of tech giants and startups like Apple, Google, Oracle, Meta, and Uber. Competition is fiercer, the Asian population is huge, accounting for 36% of the total population, and the average salary is much higher compared to other parts of the United States and skewed to the right due to the sheer number of tech jobs. Personally, my salary doubled switching jobs from Boston to Cupertino, even though my expenses dropped, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. And although I made a lot more money, it did however come at a small price. I was assigned to work on the iPhone 15 when I first got there. And as some of you probably know, working in the tech industry, particularly smartphones, is pretty fast paced and dynamic because new phones are coming out every year. This means hours are long and there is a work hard, play hard mindset. It's just sort of expected and customary to work 12 hours a day, six days a week to stay on track and on top of things. That being said, I probably learned more in three months working here than the three years at my first job. This is because oftentimes I would find myself stepping outside of my comfort zone to take full ownership of projects and having spontaneous back-to-back -back meetings late into the night. So it's definitely not a chill job and can be stressful at times. You can think of it like finals week except much more prolonged. So you can definitely burn out if you're not careful because you're working most of the time. And during the times you're not working, you still end up thinking about all of your work projects and deliverables. However, working in the tech industry is great because everyone is passionate and proud of their work. Everyone's super nice and helpful for the most part, but because everyone is super busy, it can be hard to get a hold of people. Now, in terms of my daily schedule, I usually wake up around 8.30 or 9 a.m., grab some breakfast and scooter for around 10 minutes to work. I sold my car after quitting my job in Boston during the pandemic and decided not to buy one in California, which helped me to cut down on expenses. Anyways, at the time I lived in Cupertino and worked in person three days a week from the office and two days from home. Once I'm there around 10 a.m., I replace apply to emails, work on presentations, proposals, attend meetings, and check as many action items off my to-do list as possible. I usually eat out with the team at nearby restaurants for lunch, or in some rare cases, I just pack my own lunch. I then leave the office around 6 or 7 p.m. and arrive home in around 10 minutes. After I get home, I'll have dinner, and depending on my schedule, I'll either hit the gym or go out for a run. I'll then come back and continue working until it's bedtime. Now, my role was a product and process development engineer, and the most important skill I would say for this job and many other mechanical engineering jobs are design for manufacture and assembly or DFMA, design of experiments or DOE, process capability analysis, and tolerance stackup analysis. This job was a lot different than my first mechanical engineering job at Sloan, which was a traditional product design engineering role. Instead of designing products from scratch following the product development process, we focused on the manufacturing side of product development and reviewed the designs of our customers for for manufacturability issues and optimize them along with the processes used to make them for mass production. This meant having a solid understanding of common manufacturing processes like CNC machining, injection molding, casting, welding, and sheet metal operations. If there happened to be manufacturing related weak points in the design, we would have to propose design changes to our customer without affecting any of the product design requirements. Just to give an example, in order for plastic injection molded parts to be manufactured manufacturable and free from defects like warpage and sink marks, the designs should seek to avoid sharp interior corners, tiny holes, thin walls, complex undercuts, and straight vertical faces. Whenever there was an opportunity, we also
also had to simplify assemblies, whether it was reducing part count or improving part designs for faster assembly. Some examples of reducing assembly complexity include replacing a separate o-ring with an overmolded seal, replacing a screw washer lock washer and nut with a single self threading screw, and integrating part features that only allow for correct assembly positions. Aside from DFMA, we also did a lot of DOEs to optimize designs and processes. The purpose of a DOE is to evaluate multiple input factors and determine their effect on a desired output. It's a very powerful tool that every mechanical engineer should master. Let's say we're manufacturing a car and wanted to optimize the paint application process. We can set up a DOE to evaluate what combination of factors like paint viscosity, dry time, and temperature, which are the inputs, will yield the optimal paint finish quality by measuring various criteria such as paint adhesion, gloss, and dryness, which are the outputs. To figure out the total number of unique factor combinations, we can use this simple formula. The total number of runs equals L to the power of K, where L is the levels and K is the number of variables or inputs. In our case, we have two levels, one low and one high, and three inputs, paint viscosity, dry time, and temperature. Therefore, if my algebra is correct, we have a total of eight runs to do. For each run, we probably want to do five trials, so in total, that's 40 tests we have to complete. This would be referred to as a two-level, three-factor, full factorial DOE. Now, if all of this jargon sounds foreign to you, don't worry because all of the statistical analysis packages out there today, like Jump, Minitab, and MATLAB, can set up a DOE for you. However, you're still going to need to develop a solid foundation of physics and math, including linear algebra, statistics, and calculus. Whether you're analyzing DOE results, designing products, or setting up failure analysis simulations. Now, if you're looking for a highly interactive, fun, and effective method for mastering these subjects, then I highly recommend checking out Brilliant, who are very kindly sponsoring today's video. Brilliant is one of the best platforms for hands-on learning with thousands of interactive lessons in math, physics, programming, data analysis, and AI. What makes Brilliant so effective is their approach to breaking down complex problems into basic elements that are easy to understand. All of their lessons are jam-packed with interactive quizzes and visuals, allowing you to experiment with concepts. This method is proven to be six times more effective than traditional lecture-based learning. All of Brilliant's content is created by an award-winning team of professors, researchers, and professionals from places like MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, and Google, so you will be learning from the best. Brilliant also boosts your critical thinking skills by focusing on problem solving, not just rote memorization. As you delve into specific topics, you will naturally become a better thinker along the way. The best part about Brilliant is it fosters a habit of daily learning, which is key for both your personal and professional growth. Brilliant makes learning incredibly easy, offering bite-sized lessons that fit into your schedule. It's the opposite of boring lectures, giving you productive learning moments whenever you've got a spare minute. Exploring data visually is a super useful course that I took on Brilliant that teaches you how to interpret and communicate data by choosing the right visualization and how to filter, group, and manipulate data sets to transform raw data into insights to make and important decisions. To try out everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash engineering gone wild or check out the link in the description below. You'll also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. If you're currently a mechanical engineering student or a mechanical engineer, you probably know how to create and read technical drawings and call out dimensions using GDNT, which stands for geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. A complicated part can have tens or even hundreds of critical dimensions and tolerances called out by a product design engineer. So we also had to perform process capability studies using dimensional data collected from part samples to ensure that a given manufacturing process is stable and can produce parts within spec over a period of time. Without going into too much detail, we can use control charts and look at the process capability index or CPK to monitor process performance and pinpoint sources of variation. We can then leverage some type of root cause analysis 
analysis that you're probably familiar with, like the fishbone diagram or the five whys, to find and eliminate the root causes of variation. Process or manufacturing engineers will then typically implement subsequent preventative and corrective actions to prevent the recurrence of these variations. This can include standardizing the process, training the operators, calibrating and maintaining machinery and tooling, and or changing materials. One other type of analysis we did was tolerance stackup analysis. Essentially, this type of analysis is used to determine the impact of the cumulative part tolerances on the fit, form, and function of the overall product assembly. There are two primary methods of tolerance analysis that mechanical engineers should know, worst case and statistical. Now, just like most mechanical engineering roles, we worked and closely collaborated with all kinds of people, including Apple engineers and managers, as well as our process and tooling engineers, quality engineers, factory technicians, and project managers. So it's very important for all engineers to develop their people skills. And because projects move at such a fast pace in the tech and consumer electronics industry, it's important for any of you thinking about getting into tech to have exceptional time and stress management skills. Now to summarize, working in Silicon Valley is amazing. You get to work on cutting edge products with the brightest people in the world. Every tech engineering job will be different in some aspect, but overall you'll find a lot of similarities between them. Higher pay, a dynamic fast paced environment, interesting and challenging problems to solve, and more Asians. Even though hours are long, Silicon Valley is the place to be. I had a blast partying with my friends from Apple and Google over the weekends, and who knows, I might get back into the tech industry someday. But for now, I'll wrap up by saying that I typically don't advise fresh mechanical engineering graduates to work in the tech industry right off the bat, especially at one of the FANG companies. Assuming that you can land a job at Apple, Meta, or Google straight out of college, which in itself is a pretty tall order, you're better off gaining experience and learning as much as you can in an entry-level mechanical engineering position in some other industry or company first. I say this because you really need to lean on your technical expertise and business acumen to work at these companies and know what's going on when projects are demanding the most out of you. This isn't meant to discourage any of you, but rather help you if you do get into tech one day. All right, guys, that's all I got for you today. As always, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my video here where I talk about how you can get engineering internships without any prior experience. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.